Okay, so uh, in the last class, I gave you this uh, peculiar example of a strain suffered by um, a disc of radius r. So the uh, idea was that uh, uh, so this this example, even though th there is a displacement that is given, namely this. So, so each point at r, uh, comma theta, so there is a disc of radius r, so it is a two dimensional problem, small r is the distance from the center and theta is uh, the angle uh, from x axis. So that specifies some point uniquely, now that point under some strain it will get displaced. So that displacement of that point is, suppose it is given by this formula, that means the displacement happens tangentially in the direction of theta and it is proportional to the distance from the center. So now you will see that um, uh, even though there is a displacement, it does not necessarily mean there is a strain in the material. So this particular example is meant to show that displacements can actually lead to zero strain which implies therefore that because there is a displacement and because there is no strain. It means that the whole uh, material has actually rotated by a fixed amount. So to see that uh, you can uh, rewrite this in Cartesian coordinates. So you write your theta hat as minus sin theta i and cos theta j and you will see that uh, this is write, writable in a Cartesian coordinate like this. So then you find out what is the new position of that. Uh, point. So, the earlier position was x, y and th this was the displacement. So, and that displacement can be written in Cartesian form like this. So, you see the new displacement will become like this x dash uh, will go to minus uh, x minus lambda y and y dash will go to y plus lambda x. So, this can be written basically as a matrix like this, right. And this is uh, essentially it is a proportional to an orthogonal matrix. So, what this means is that uh, that uh, there is a rotation, okay. So, there is an overall rotation by some angle and there is a shift, uh, I mean the distance from the center is kind of uniformly shifted in, in all directions. So, there is a scaling, so the distance uh, shifts in, and there is a uniform rotation. So, as a result there is no strain in the material. So, strain happens when uh, you know different parts of the material shift by different amounts. But here the whole material is shifting th the same way in all locations. So, therefore, there is no strain suffered by the material, okay. So, now let us discuss another example which also involves something like twisting. So, the earlier example seemed like something is getting twisted, but then that twisting does not result in strain, it just results in overall rotation. But the next example is uh, you have a twisting which actually results in, a, in strain and stress. So this example is uh, this, imagine a cylinder which is subjected to two forces. So you have a cylinder like this, basically what you do is you twist, uh, twist this cylinder here in this direction and in this direction you twist it in. So basically you twist it in opposite direction holding the two ends. So obviously you are uh, causing a strain and that is called torsion. So that is called simple tor torsion means twisting. So basically the top part of the cylinder, uh, so you can think of this as the bottom. I mean I should have written it like this maybe then it would make sense. So this is top, this is bottom. So the idea is that you are twisting this, so you are applying force per unit area which is in the angular direction. So that means in the tangential direction phi hat and it increases as you go away from the center. So, so the cylindrical coordinates are of course natural here. So and the coordinates are basically r theta, r phi and z, r corresponds to a distance from the axis the central axis to the point uh, you are interested in, the shortest distance from the central axis to the point you are interested in and uh, phi is the angle made with some arbitrarily chosen x axis, in, you know in a plane that is 
parallel to the top and bottom faces and uh, the Z of course is along the central axis. So now uh, given those uh, coordinates then we say that uh, imagine that the force that you apply per unit area on the top uh, face of the cylinder is proportional to R but in the twisting direction phi and the bottom you twist it the opposite way so it's minus so it's minus g alpha r phi for the bottom plus g alpha, alpha r phi for the top so now obviously we expect strain and stress here because you are actually twisting something i mean it's not reasonable to suspect that this whole material all parts of the material are twisting the same way in fact they are not we expect the center portion to remain untwisted because uh, the top is getting twisted in one direction it's the other the bottom is getting twisted in a different direction anyway uh, bottom line is that uh, so you got to solve for the stress tensor so the stress tensor obeys a whole bunch of equations that i have pointed out one is the uh, equilibrium condition that is uh, that because the cylinder does not move uh, under the application of these external twisting forces rather it deforms see unlike a rigid body a rigid body when you apply a force or a torque or whatever it will start to angularly accelerate uh, but here the response is different and namely it deforms so this is not a rigid body it is a, it's a deformable elastic body so it rather than angularly accelerate it deforms so clearly you need a balancing force uh, uh, so in other words you have to make sure that if there are bulk forces they have to be such that the divergence of the stress plus the bulk force is zero we just showed uh, some time back that that is the condition that's a necessary condition for this uh, that elastic body to be in equilibrium means not accelerate so clearly now uh, we are assuming that uh, the m m weight of this uh, cylinder can be ignored maybe you are doing this in outer space or in a sp uh, you know in the international space station you are doing this experiment so everything is freely falling so everything is weightless so in that case uh, there is no there are no body forces so then divergence of sigma is 0 rather than divergence of sigma plus fb being 0 it is divergence of sigma is 0 because fb is the force uh, per unit volume the body force which is absent and secondly this is some assumption that is consistent with uh, uh, what we have kind of uh, seen earlier that, uh, that the stresses uh, basically are uh, you know the forces that you apply are in the angular directions so so clearly the radial forces are absent because uh, you know nothing is being pulled in the radial direction so it's you are pulling it angularly okay so there will be components in the z direction because uh, you see you are pulling angularly in one way when z is plus l by 2 and you are pulling angularly in a different opposite way when z is minus l by 2 so you expect components along z also but you do not expect components along r because you are pulling the same way for fixed r it is the same so that is the reason why we assume this I mean if it is not an immediately obvious to you why this is a reasonable statement you just uh, you know you just go along with what I have said and then you work backwards and convince yourself that this is in fact correct ok so now uh, clearly by definition the because stress is given I mean we have assumed that sigma is a stress so if stress is uh, it is not really given but we have assumed we have a symbol for it namely sigma so if stress is denoted by sigma which is a symbol then the k component of the stress on top of the uh, cylinder ought to be equal to the force per unit area that you are applying on top of the cylinder so that is the this relation so similarly on the bottom it has to be this so put them all together and then you can convince yourself that this makes sense ok so this is again I have rewritten in terms of the Cartesian just like I did earlier that 
that phi hat can be rewritten in the Cartesian i and j. So, when you do that uh, you will be able to rewrite it like this. So, this uh, circle with a cross inside it is called a tensor product you do not have to be uh, scared by this. This all this means is that this refers to the uh, uh, x z component. So, this is basically uh, I mean this is the x z component. So, this one. So, this is the x z component of sigma. So, this is the z x component of sigma and this is the j z component, this is the z j component. Okay. So, there are all these components. So, this has been uh, you know like this uh, is consistent with these conditions. Okay. So, now you can go ahead and ask yourself what is the uh, stress on the surface of the cylinder. Okay. So, the reason why uh, we need this on the surface of the cylinder clearly uh, you do not expect uh, stresses. So, the stresses propagate uh, in the z direction. So, there is a twisting in the in the phi direction and they propagate in the uh, z direction. So, on the surface uh, it is got to be 0 and we impose this condition that on, on the surface of the cylinder there are no stresses. Okay. So, on the surface of the cylinder this is what that is. So, if that is the case then uh, you can rewrite now remember what we wrote about this this is the strain tensor, strain tensor. So, the strain tensor was basically uh, related to the stress tensor in what way? So, remember what we, we wrote about the strain tensor. So, the strain tensor had a well defined uh, relation in terms of the stress tensor. Okay. See namely this. Okay. Uh, well, let us look at for the most general case. Yeah, this one. So, the strain is related to stress in this way. This is the most general one. So, the stress strain relation. So, if you use that uh, relation, so you will uh, basically since the diagonal components are 0 right because there is no uh, diagonal components of the stress. So, therefore, the diagonal components of the strain are also 0. So, in the off diagonal components have this coefficient here. So, which involves the Poisson ratio in Young's modulus. So, this clearly shows that all the diagonal components of strain are 0 and specifically along the x y uh, directions also the strain are 0 only the x z and z x components and y z and z y components are non zero. Okay. So, now uh, you can uh, so now this you know how this is related to this. So, this is basically uh, u x by uh, z plus uh, d u z by x. So, similarly here this is one half of uh, d u y by d z plus d u uh, z by d y is not it. So, you simply integrate these two relations and you will get this displacement and this is interesting because what this says is basically that at any given point x y z the point I mean no point displaces vertically. So, that is to be expected because you are taking a cylinder you are twisting the bottom portion in a uh, anti clockwise way and the top portion in a clockwise way. So, there is no reason why anything should shift vertically. So, they will shift uh, tangentially. So, that is what is happening here. So, the, the amount by which it shifts in the x direction is proportional to z and y and it is in one sense. So, it basically it tells you exactly how that cylinder is getting twisted means how all the points in the cylinders are getting displaced. So, this is clearly an example where there is a uh, strain and stress. So, this is the strain that, that appears in the material and the stress is similar. So, because of this twisting you uh, the material uh, undergoes a strain and the strain undergoes this displacement. So, it is interesting to know that you can explicitly calculate. So, so in other words once you uh, figure this out you can actually you know explain what the shape of that 
cylinder will look like. You can probably even plot the shape of the cylinder. So just imagine, so I would encourage you to use some software like MATLAB Mathematica and you know plot some before and after pictures. So before you apply any of these twisting forces, what does the cylinder look like and what does it look like after you apply the twisting forces, okay. So that is an activity worth doing, I encourage you to do that and uh, I think I will leave that to some of the exercises. So now let us uh, uh, revert to some uh, more general statements regarding uh, the formalism. So I told you that uh, there are some general constraints obeyed by the stress and strain tensors and uh, one of them is this equilibrium condition which ensures that the elastic material does not accelerate uh, upon application of stress rather it deforms. So, uh, so the, the condition that ensures that is uh, to is the condition which says that the divergence of the stress tensor should be compensated by the body forces. Uh, if it does not get compensated in this way, the material will uh, accelerate in addition to being deformed. So, we will of course not consider that possibility, we will consider pure deformation. So now, uh, point is that I have been repeatedly telling you that any such uh, uh, you know differential equation can be thought of as a consequence of an extremum problem. That means you take some functional and you minimize with respect to some uh, uh, some other parameter or some other uh, uh, function, and then. You ask uh, what is the uh, condition under which that function becomes or functional becomes minimum. And uh, so, so we showed that Lagrange, I mean basically the, for example, Maxwell's equations can be thought of as the Euler-Lagrange equation of uh, some suitable Lagrangian. And of course, the Euler-Lagrange equations themselves are a consequence of the extremum principle that is minimizing the action. So similarly here also uh, this uh, equilibrium condition can be thought of as a consequence of minimizing some internal um, stress induced energy of the system, okay, elastic strain it is called, so it is called strain energy okay, specifically because of course stress induces strain and strain uh, you know the strain in the material is some kind of a potential energy, it has a very uh, anthropic uh, relation also that means uh, we all know that when strain builds up you know when we are stressed uh, we are also strained like psychologically and that strain that builds up is some kind of a potential energy and then to release strain we shout at people and that sort of thing. So uh, that is the psychological aspect of stress and strain but here it is a very physical manifestation but the parallels are quite striking. So you have uh, stresses that are applied on the material which induce strain and strain builds up and manifests itself as a form of potential energy. So now the question is what we want to do is we want to find the potential energy uh, that is uh, you know pent up in the material uh, as a result of this strain. So we make this very general statement that you know any uh, any 2 by 2 matrix its components can if it is linearly related sigma and epsilon are 2 2 by 2 matrices that are linearly related and clearly I should be able to write them with some proportionality coefficients which this capital M is what that is. And then further I assume that uh, the body forces are derivable from a scalar potential that I am that means I am assuming conservative body forces, typically the weight of the material itself or if it is a fluid or something it would be some pressure even if it is a solid it could be some external pressure but typically it is the weight of the material. So I go ahead and substitute these two, this is, uh, this is just uh, the stress strain relation which just says that stress is proportional to strain and then I substitute that here and uh, 
and then I substitute the body force uh, there and I get this equals 0. So now you see this relation may be thought of as the consequence of some variational principle. So what you do is that you multiply this by some delta u which can be arbitrary and you integrate over some region and then you say that is equal to 0 and then you say that this is this relation is valid for every every delta u. So if this is valid for every delta u that means that this itself has to be 0. So these two statements are the same. Okay, so now uh, the reason why I wrote it like this is because I can go ahead and rewrite this uh, 4.94 as a delta of something. So I want to write this as delta of something equals 0. So that will mean basically I am minimizing this something. So I want to write this as delta of something equals 0. So then I do all my integration by parts for this. So you see uh, I do my integration by parts and your gradient will come on this and so on and so forth and uh, yeah and then I have this uh, gradient which I split it up into you know this is like a you know the Gauss theorem. So it, this is uh, like the divergence of something you know it is the divergence of uh, some something else. So this is uh, d3x but then this will be the surface integral of that. So basically that is what I have done here okay. Well firstly right now it does not look like divergence so that is why I have to integrate by parts. I have to first uh, differentiate with respect to uh, this. So if I integrate by parts this derivative goes and sits here in the middle here. But then this derivative sitting in the middle means that it will first give me divergence but it will also give me some term which is not a divergence which is this one. So I have to make sure I subtract that out. So when I do that I get these two terms. So this is a consequence of applying Gauss's theorem. So this was a divergence of mi right. So which is basically divergence m. So uh, I think you should uh, think deeply about this because some of these steps can be a little bit tricky. So I will allow you to think deeply about this. But this is straightforward calculus. So there is no physics here, it is just calculus. So now I go ahead and uh, use my symmetry properties that uh, because these matrices epsilon and sigma are symmetric and furthermore this is uh, this is basically the trace of epsilon is uh, just uh, divergence of uh, or basically yeah, uh, so the divergence of u uh, which is the displacement and then I also use this uh, general statement about epsilon. So when I do all that I substitute all that here and then I will be able to show that uh, this, this equation so in other words this equation which becomes this. So this this equation, so this equation, so I substitute instead of this I substitute this and then finally all this becomes this and this can be written finally like this okay. So it is, so that is what I promised earlier that I am going to rewrite this equation which see this was my condition the equilibrium condition I multiplied this whole thing by delta of u and integrated and said so these two are the same provided this is valid for any delta of u. So since that is valid for any of delta of u I can simply rewrite this as the variation of some something equals 0 so which is what I was driving at and that something is basically the elastic energy density which is given by this okay and uh, since this is equal to epsilon so I can rewrite this as uh, the elastic energy density. So it has two parts one is uh, basically the trace of sigma times uh, epsilon times sigma is uh, one of them and uh, the other is uh, uh, due to the body forces. So if body forces are absent the strain energy is simply given by the trace of one half of the trace of the strain times the stress. So uh, and that is your strain uh, strain energy density or the elastic energy density. 
So that is the uh, energy density that is kind of pent up in your elastic material because it is holding on to strain. Okay. So minimizing this will amount to enforcing the equilibrium condition. Okay. All right. So um, I think this uh, completes uh, the discussion of elasticity theory. So I think the uh, bottom line is that there are many uh, steps in especially in the derivations that are quite technical and uh, they are going to be necessarily hard to follow unless you actually sit down and work out all the steps which is the reason why I have brought out this book. So it is imperative that you go through the book and uh, make sure that you work out all steps and if you have doubts you uh, send me a message asking me how I got from here to there. So uh, it is only when you work out all the steps on your own that you can actually understand. So it is impossible for you to simply understand just by staring at some equation for a few minutes. So you have to work it out okay? and that applies to everyone including people who have worked in this field for a long time. Okay? So they also get stuck because human mind is evolutionarily not equipped to handle equations you know we were hunter gatherers in the distant past and our bodies and minds are evolutionarily adapted to do very mundane things. So it is with great difficulty we are able to reach up to this level. So effort is necessary. So you have to put in effort in order to uh, overcome your evolutionary adapted brains. Okay, so uh, I am going to stop here and in the next class I am going to discuss a new topic which is uh, Euler basically the fluid mechanics. right? So I am going to discuss the theory of fluids which is you know elastic materials which are also modeled like elastic materials but they are elastic materials that uh, do not deform under shear stress but rather accelerate under shear stress. So in the earlier case I assume that uh, no type of stress will induce an acceleration in the material so that would correspond to a perfectly elastic uh, medium. But fluids are elastic only in some limited sense but if you apply shear stress they will accelerate. Okay. So that is how you define a fluid an elastic medium that suffers acceleration instead of deformation upon application of shear stress. Okay, so I am going to stop here and in the next class let us discuss fluid mechanics. Thank you. Mm -hmm.